I will start by welcoming everyone who is here on this webinar. Today, we'll be talking about buying a home for the first time. So if a first time home buyer who is here, this is your webinar. I came up with this topic because it is one of the, we have a YouTube channel and we have a video there that a lot of people have been watching. So we see that there's definitely interest. People want to know, like in this market that's shifting, people want direction, especially from a mortgage perspective. Yeah. So I'm very excited that you guys are here. Uh, as you may already know, my name is Justin Nicholas. I'm a realtor. I am also an investor um, here in Southern Ontario. We started real estate, you know, came to Canada in 2011, but we bought our first property in 2014. And uh, at the time, I was still a student, and um, my husband and I started buying more properties. I was also still, so when I graduated, I started working uh, for the government of Ontario as an economist. So I did that for a few years before I switched to real estate full time. The reason I'm sharing this is because I know that there are people who are in my shoes, who maybe are looking to buy their first home, buy a second, you still have a career, but your goal is to transition maybe to investing or you just want to buy your first home. So I'm super excited that you're here today because information is usually a good starting point. I must say that when we bought our first property, we didn't even, you know, know that we could, but when we got the information we needed, we got on a path and a plan to get started. So I'm very excited that you're here today. Here with me today is Luke Robinson. He's one of my favorite mortgage brokers. His company, uh, they help a lot of our clients with financing. That is why I selected him to come here today. I know that Luke has been in this industry for a long time and he has some insights that are very helpful for first time home buyers. So look, I'm very excited to have you here. I look forward to, you know, seeing what you what you have um, in this presentation for first time home buyers. And I know that a lot of people probably have questions that you'll be answering. So I'm looking forward to that. And I also would like to thank you for taking the time to for, uh, for taking the time to be here. So welcome, and um, I can't wait to learn from you tonight. Yeah, absolutely. And it's uh, so great to be here. I always love joining your webinars. Um, I always find it to be super informative sessions. And so far, you've been, you've been getting great feedback. So again, thank you for having me. It really is. Uh, it's always great to work with you, Jocelyn. Absolutely. It's my pleasure. Perfect. Um, okay. So, uh, you know, it's a high level what we're getting into today, or maybe even just an introduction of myself. You know, I've been in the mortgage business for almost a decade now. I got into it right at a university, University of Guelph. Also got my degree in economics. I didn't know about that about you, Jocelyn. So we jumped right in. I had some family in the business and uh, since then got garnered a lot of experience. Um, I've seen markets go through, you know, several ups and downs over the last decade, um, you know, which has provided me with a lot of insights. Um, and now, um, I know I'm sure a lot of people on this call have noticed, we're seeing a little bit of a decline in prices that, that's going around, you know, various markets, some being hit more than others. Um, you know, whenever this happens, we always see an inflow of interest from first-time buyers because there's you know easier price points to get it at so you know with with jocelyn brought this up and we thought it would be a great opportunity to just pr provide some high level information that will help first-time buyers or people that are thinking about getting in a home you know whether it's in a couple months maybe it's a year to now maybe it's two years from now at least you'll uh, this after this presentation you'll be left with some solid framework to see where you stand right now you know in this, uh, you know, in the buyer's market, um, you know, and if you don't fit in right now, um, you'll see, be able to help you put together a roadmap of how to get there. Okay. So that's the goal of this presentation right now. Um, I know uh, Jocelyn did say some questions are coming in. I will answer all of the questions. Um, I look forward to that. So we'll get that to that at, right at the end. So just to start us off here, first thing I wanted to get into is down payment on a property. One of the first things before you start considering income, before you start creating credit is asking yourself, do I have the available funds that I'm willing to put uh, as down payment into a property right now? Okay. And if not, you know, how far am I, how far away am I until I get to that point? Okay. Now there's two types of mortgages um, that really are affected by uh, down payment. Um, one is called insured and one is called conventional. Um, you know, th those uh, words and their definitions are not extremely relevant, but they do have two major differences that can affect you, okay? So an insured mortgage is when you put less than 20% down, okay? So, you know, if you're buying a home and you, it's say, let's say it's a $500,000 purchase price, 20% down would be $100,000. 
So anything less than that $100,000 down on a $500,000 property would be considered insured. Okay. The section option is conventional, and that just includes any mortgage that has 20% down or more. So it'd be the opposite of what I just said. You know, if $100,000 is conventional, anything below that is insured, anything above that is conventional. Now, why does this matter? You're probably asking yourself, okay? Well, the major difference between insured and conventional is the difference of a 25 year amortization or a 30 year amortization. Now, the diff what amortization is here, let's say you got a mortgage at 25 years. Basically, what that means is you will pay it off your mortgage in 25 years. Whereas if you have a mortgage at 30 years, you'll take it off in 30 years. Now, again, that is important because 25-year amortizations have slightly higher payments than 30-year amortizations. Anyway, well, this will come back into play in a little bit. Um, uh, can we move to the next slide? Uh, so minimum down payment. A lot of people are wondering, you know, it's, it's not always easy to save up money for down payment, to kind of have put away that disposable cash um, and get it ready for some real estate. Now, so I wanted to run people down, you know, what is the minimum required down payment for a home? Now, uh, the minimum required down payment for a home, as stated in this slide, is 5% down on the first $500,000 in purchase price, okay? After your purchase price exceeds $500,000, you then have to put down 10% down on the additional dollars over 500. So I have some examples here in box number two. So let, if you look at the first example there, half a million dollar purchase price equals a down payment of minimum of $25,000, 5% 5 of 500,000. Now in option two, you see a purchase price of $750,000, okay? Now, uh, so now we're looking at a purchase price that is over 5%, okay? So the down payment for that would be $25,000 for the first 500,000, that in down payment, okay? Now the additional $250,000 in purchase price that gets you to 750 also has a $25,000 down payment. So that would leave you with a total down payment of $50,000. Um, the reason I wanted to include this is it's actually a recent change that the government put in. Before you were able to put down just 5% all the way up to a million. And we have seen circumstances where people kind of buy homes um, over a million with just that minimum 5% and it doesn't quite qualify. So you just want to keep that rule in mind that if you're looking at purchase prices over half a, a half a million, that you calculate that additional bit of down payment that's required. Okay. Um, the other thing is conventional. We included here, again, pretty straightforward is that these are just 20% uh, down. So 20% down on $500,000 would be a hundred and 20% down on $750,000 would be 150. Okay. You want to move to the next slide? Uh, okay, so where can savings come from? Uh, again, very straightforward slide here. Uh, the main thing is personal savings, your RRSPs, which are a re uh, registered account, or a gift from a family member. So, you know, a lot, you know, most people will come in and they'll have the money saved up. But a lot of times people go, well, you know what? I can draw on my $20,000 line of credit and I can use this for down payment, right? Uh, you know, the answer, unfortunately, uh, is no. Uh, the bank, uh, any bank wants to see your personal, uh, the funds for down payment are coming from personal savings. So just be careful, um, you know, using debt um, to, to buy a home. And the other thing too, is a lot of people say that, you know, uh, can a family member give it, uh, me the funds? And that is true. A family member can send you the money and that uh, money can also be used for down payment. Now, I wanted to include closing costs. Even though these are costs that have come at the end of the transaction, I did wanna pair this with the topic of down payment because you need to have down payment for a property and closing costs, okay? So what the bank needs to see that you have in your savings is 1.5% of the purchase price in down, uh, in uh, ready for closing costs, okay? Now, in uh, the two examples below here, you will see the two main things that are gonna become, that, that are considered closing costs on a real estate transaction, okay? Now, if you look at example one here, it's land transfer taxes. Land transfer taxes are essentially uh, like sales tax on real estate. It's like when you go and buy a bag of chips, they add on some tax on top of it and you pay for it just the once, okay? 
So it's a one-time tax that you pay before you close on your home, okay? Now below that, I added in an example of what you can expect in closing costs on a $500,000 purchase, okay? And the answer there is about $6,475 in land transfer taxes are to be paid. Now, one thing to keep in mind is, is as a first time home buyer, the Canadian government actually rebates you back 4,000. So if you, if you include the rebate, um, on top of what the, tra the taxes are, it's only about $2,475, okay? Uh, normally on a mortgage transactions, this takes up the bulk of the additional cost above your down payment, okay? So again, important not to you know think this is part of down payment, this is on top of your down payment, okay? Uh, now this, the last item there is just legal fees. Uh, many people don't know this, um, but you do need a lawyer to close all more, uh, real estate transactions, okay? Um, real estate transactions have you know legally binding contracts. That's what a purchase to buy a house is. They're legally binding contracts. Um, and at the end of the day, you're gonna want your own lawyer on there to make sure you're protected. Make sure things are being looked at, uh, you know, make sure the, you know, the right clauses are in there. And they're, so they're there to make sure that this real estate transaction is in your uh, best interest, okay? Uh, you know, I know everybody says that lawyers are super expensive, but in real estate, they're not too bad. Normally, I would say on a normal real estate transaction, you're looking at about $1,500 to $2,000, again, on top of that down payment, okay? So just two main things there to keep in mind. Uh, as that will represent the bulk of your additional cost when buying your first home, okay? Perfect, uh, you wanna go to the next slide? Okay, uh, now we'll jump into the next thing is credit. Um, you know, a lot of people uh, are worried about credit. Does taking on debt hurt me? Should I open up a credit card? I don't want my credit score to go down. So uh, there probably will be some more questions about this at the end, but just very high surface level, if you, there's lots of websites now that can give you your credit score. If you're putting less than 20% down in that insured mortgage calculate category, you want to have a minimum score, credit score of 680. Okay. If you have 20% down, your the minimum allowed score now goes down to about 620. Okay. Now the two main things I see that hurt people's credit. So these are the things that take your make your score come down. Okay, you'll see that in box number two there. Number one, late payments. Don't pay your credit cards late. Don't miss any car payments, okay? Now, uh, a little bit of context to what that means. A lot of people think, you know, oh, if I you know, borrowed $10 on my credit card, if I don't pay it back or pay the interest on it in 10 days, it actually is registered as a late payment. So late payments actually don't get registered on your credit bureau until they're more than 30 days late. So that you have to go to the date it's due plus 30 days. Now, I wouldn't recommend waiting all that time to pay the interest on your credit card. Only reason I bring this up is I've seen people that say, oh, well, well payday's not for another week or so, and I wanna pay it then. You have that breathing room, so and you're not gonna be penalized on your credit bureau, okay? Uh, the second thing that uh, affects your credit negatively that most people aren't aware of is keeping your balance. So let's say you have a balance of $10,000 on your credit card, of keeping your uh, borrowed balance too high. So this would be like, for example, keeping your credit card uh, owing at like eight to $9,000. So you know, 80 to 90% of your limit is uh, drawn upon for extended periods of time. So what does that mean? Not to be confused with spending $8,000 on your credit card and then paying off. That is completely fine. It's again, keeping it at that high balance month over month over month can affect your credit score negatively. So just something to keep in mind of, you know, when you're balancing your, uh, your debt um, out there is that you want to keep maybe your higher items that are more maxed out, start paying those down as opposed to the other ones as well. So uh, if there's any other questions again on credit, I know there's often many, we can jump into those at the end. Um, wanna go to the next uh, slide here. So uh, what kind of uh, income, uh, you know, uh, would, do we use to get them, uh, uh, you know, to qualify for a mortgage, okay? Now there's uh, three main types of income out there. Um, and this right here just gives you a very brief list of, you know, what you would need to provide. 
Um, I know sometimes people get nervous about what, what do they have to show the bank? What's the bank going to ask from me? Um, which are all valid uh, concerns and questions, but this really kind of breaks it down for you, okay? So just briefly, um, if you're a salary or an hourly worker, okay, really all you're going to need to confirm your income is a letter of employment from your employer saying, you know, John Doe is employed here. This is his pay. A pay stub will confirm that, and then your T4 from your last year. And that's really it. That confirms your income from the bank. So often I find when people know that's all it takes, it seems a lot less concerning. Uh, the banks really just want to know that you're currently employed, and that's the main thing, okay? Now, if you're a self-employed person and you're looking to buy a home, um, there is a little bit more required. Um, and that's because they do look into your tax documents, um, being you, they, they need to see a tax history of two years. So two years notice of assessments, two years T1 general. And if you are a self-employed person, it's often important to understand that the income the bank is going to use to qualify you for your mortgage is your taxable income. Again, I, I, one thing we see a lot is a lot of people go, I made $200,000 last year, but after, you know, their, their, their uh, you know, rightful tax deductions, they kind of, they end up with a $40,000 uh, NOA, right? So it's important to understand that the bank isn't going to use your gross business income to qualify for a mortgage. Um, they're going to use to your average from your net income. Um, there are some uh, lenders that, uh, that will look at other things, but that's for a different conversation. For the most part, if you're self-employed, these are the kinds of things you need to keep in mind. Okay, perfect. So I wanted to put this slide together right here to help maybe people look at what box do they fit in? What are they close to? And what does that get them in this housing market? Okay. So uh, this is something that if anybody wants to download the presentation would be a good frame of reference to kind of see where you sit in this. So I created, uh, you know, four examples here, and I put in different uh, household incomes. Um, and then that, uh, if you go along, I show you how much you can afford, what your monthly payment would be based on today's interest rates, and what your down payment would be. So again, just on a high level here, um, you know, if you made $80,000 a year, um, that gets you about a purchase price of $350,000, assuming you're putting the minimum down payment of 5%. And that would leave you with a monthly payment of about $1,800. Okay. If you have a household income of $120,000, that jumps your, your um, purchase price up to about five fifty. dollars again, with minimum down payment of $30,000. And you can see the associated payment there. Okay. Now, uh, if you go down to example three and four, you can see the property prices uh, do jump up quite a bit with $120,000 income getting you about an $800,000 property with 20% down. And the big reason for this is the 30-year amortization that I mentioned from the very beginning slide. So this, again, helps lower your payments and helps you qualify for more mortgage, therefore more purchase price. Okay. So again, I hope that, that, that that's helpful. I know when I bought my house, I got a graph like this and it kind of let me know more or less what I can afford. So, but everybody's going to be different this, and that's what's important to understand, right? Sometimes you'll, you won't be landing in just those at income brackets, but maybe you have more down payment. Maybe you have higher income, but less down payment. Um, and those are numbers that can always be crunched specifically for you and catered directly to you to show you exactly where you're at. Um, I know Jocelyn's going to put up, I think, my information. And if anybody wants to know, you know, at exact point of where they currently stand, uh, that's something that can be done 100%. And that's the end of it. Thank you very much, Luke. This is very informative. I actually did like how you broke it down from like income, uh, down payment, monthly payment. I really like that because it's easy for someone to see. And I like that you've offered that, you know, people can reach out to you specifically. Um, we are trying to put a link in the chat box, but I think we're having technical issues with that. We'll still keep trying. If we can't, please just reach out to me and I'll connect you with, look, this is my information here, my email, my phone number, as well as our social media. Now, yeah, look, I, yeah go ahead. Sorry, I, I was just going to add that, you know, uh, one of, uh, you know, the best, you know, parts about working with us is um, there is no rush to buy anything. So, mm -hmm. you know, if you're thinking about buying a place in five years, I would still love to hear from you and hear maybe what your concerns are, what yeah. you're working towards. 
and just start help working with you now. Um, and that's just, you know, maybe it will help you achieve your goals earlier. So again, I want to stress there is never a, a time that's uh, too far out or maybe you're too early to kind of get in touch and maybe start thinking about this. And, you know, if that's the case, I'm here to help you 100%. And I know Jocelyn is as well. Absolutely. And I love that because that's what we're here for helping people, right? And I find that, you know, when you speak to someone, then you have true information. Because I know I have clients too who used to do this in the past. They listen to their neighbors, their uncle, their auntie. And a lot of the time it's like, oh, you know, you can't do this. You know, wait. Those people, they love you. They tell you what they know, but they don't have accurate information because they don't work in the industry. So, one of my favorite things is be careful who you take advice from. Anyway, that's a topic for another one, uh, another day. But while you were presenting, we had questions that came in. We also have um, questions that were submitted ahead of time. But I actually have one of my own questions that I wanted to ask because I get it a lot. Absolutely. Do you have solutions for self-employed people who have been working for less than two years? There are solutions for people that have been working for less than two years. I wouldn't say that this usually comes up in the first time buyer space uh, because those solutions really do just become available at the 20% down marker. Um, A lot of first time buyers I see to have that less than 20% down. Mm -hmm. Um, So again, there are options. Uh, You know, maybe we can get to more in detail on them on another webinar. Absolutely. Um, but again, that, that benchmark where they become available is at 20% down. So again, something okay. to keep in mind. Yeah, I actually love that. We should mark that down as a topic for an, another webinar, you know, finding mm-hmm. solutions or financing solutions for self-employed people. I th- I've heard a lot, like I've, I've had conversations with people who would love to hear that. Now, I'm going to dive into the questions that were submitted ahead of time. I'm just going to mention that if you have any more questions, please keep submitting them. Keep them coming. Um, We'll try to answer. We have time, actually. We do have enough time to be able to get through a few. And while I'm speaking, I just realized that the link to book a one-on-one consultation has been posted in the chat box. So if you would like to book a consultation, please follow the link and book a consultation and I will connect you with Luke so he can look into your situation specifically. Okay, I have the questions. Question number one, Luke, is can you please discuss the vendor take back? I know that this is probably a question that is a little too advanced for a lot of people, but it's a question that we have here was pre-submitted. Um, can you please maybe in, in brief talk about what a vendor take back is? So I'm happy to talk about what a vendor take back is. Again, it's uh, normally something that a first time buyer is not going to run into, but what it is used for is so, you know, if we're talking a mortgage is a loan from a bank to a borrower. Okay. That's a mortgage. A vendor take back is a mortgage from the seller to the buyer. Mm -hmm. So as an example, if you, um, if somebody's selling a home for, let's say a million dollars, um, and the buyer says they want a vendor take back, um, let's say for 50%, that means that they're going to give the homeowner $500,000 And the remaining amount of the purchase price will get registered as a mortgage. Um, Now, the terms of those mortgage is dependent on what's negotiated between the seller and the buyer. Um, But the big difference between BTB, vendor take backs, and traditional mortgages with the banks is that the bank is not involved. These are private loans between the seller and the buyer. So again, not very commonly seen in first-time buying situations. Yeah. Um, but also not that complicated of a topic. I find sometimes these uh, these words and these definitions seem like they're so complicated and inaccessible. Yeah. Um, but really, when you break it down, it's it's very quite simple. Yeah, it's an agreement between two parties, right? Whatever parties, the seller yes. and buyer will agree to. And actually, one thing I so, love about that is that you can negotiate the rate. That's yes. one thing that that with the banks you don't get to do. <laughs> Of course. Of yeah. Course. Our second question is, um, I want to know how people who are earning almost as much as me can afford to buy bigger houses. Does savings um, have a role to play in it? So savings has a role to play in it. And I think too, one thing you have to keep in mind is uh, a lot, most first time home buyers, um, maybe you're not aware of this, you haven't bought your first home is that about 70% of them, that's my annual statistics, mm-hmm. have a parental or family member co-signer. Oh, uh, now, what does that mean? 
Um, now, like you said, maybe you have a colleague making you know, as much as much as you, but they're buying a home and you're going, you know, what the heck is happening here? How yeah. are they doing it? Uh, the truth of the matter is uh, a few things, but I could maybe break them down a bit. Number one, maybe they do have that larger down payment. As stated in the, you know, in the presentation here, if you have 20% down, you can buy quite a bit more house as opposed to somebody who only has five or 10% down. Yeah. Uh, the second option is maybe they had a parental signer that came in. Now, you know, if you have uh, the husband and wife both make $50,000 a year, your household income is $100,000. If you have a parent, parental figure or family member who let's say makes another 50, we can now use that income to help qualify for more house. Yeah. So um, those are two examples. And again, you know, something also to think about for yourself you know, is this an option for me and my family or is it not an option for you and your family? Um, and then uh, build on top of those from there. Yeah. Wow. I am surprised that the number is as high as 70%. 70% of first time home buyers have a co-signer. Wow. I yeah. didn't know that the number was that high. I, it's only getting higher. Um, yeah. You know, even with the, you know, the slight price uh, reductions in recent months, yeah. they're still so, so high. Than when their parents bought or when our parents yeah, purchased right, their homes, yeah. right? You know, I grew up in one of those uh, those homes in, you know, the Toronto area that, you know, they bought it for $200,000 and they sold it for well over a million, okay? Yeah. Um, and if you look at the, you know, the, the, the comparison for how much mortgage you get for how much purchase price, I'm sorry, for income to purchase price, yeah. um, our parents just didn't need to make as much money as we do now yeah. to afford real estate, the same house, uh, yeah. you know, so it is, uh, it's a different landscape for sure. Um, and you know, that probably, that all plays a role. So, mm. yeah, that's interesting. Our third question is with the mortgage rates going up, would you suggest a first time home buyer to buy a pre-construction that will be ready in 2024? So, um, from the perspective of your hoping rates will be lower in 2024, you can do that. That makes sense. Um, but you don't, there's often when you're thinking about making that gamble, and it is a gamble, because if you're hoping on making a decision based on future information that we don't know, um, you also want to make sure you're taking into consideration other things. That's so again, if, a prop, if properties continue to decrease in price, that could prevent, present, present an issue in 2024, right? And um, so it, it, the benefit of higher interest rates is properties go down in value. And that's mm -hmm. why first time buyers are getting interested. So, you know, in a, in, you know from where we, uh, Jocelyn and I, the markets we both mainly operate in, which is the Tri-Cities area here. Yeah. You know, I've seen properties that were, you know, uh, gone for $800,000 six months ago to, to $600,000 now. It's true. So now understand, it, now that you're buying at $600,000, you're going to borrow money on that property to higher rate. And I understand it's, un it's uncomfortable. Nobody wants to pay the bank more money. Yeah. But one thing you're not doing by buying a house at $600,000 at a higher interest rate is having to pay back that additional $200,000 from the person who borrowed at uh, um, maybe a lower interest rate, but a higher purchase price. Yeah. $200,000 is still, no matter what the interest rate is, I don't care if it's 1%, is a lot of money to pay back. It is. Okay. It is a so lot of money. Yeah. Just something to keep in mind. So again, you know, if for pre-construction, you know, if your goal really is interest rate, maybe they'll be lower by 2024, but maybe they won't. Um, you know, mm -hmm. it's you know, the, you, you want we want to do your own research on that. If you ask my opinion, I won't talk about it on the webinar. I'd be happy to give it to you. Uh, but again, just make sure you're taking everything into consideration, and also yeah. remember that rate is interest rate is not always the only thing that matters. Yeah. I like that look. And I think that in addition to that, I'm just going to say that you have to be careful with pre-construction because you are, you only take what the builder is providing, you know, it's hard yep. to negotiate with the builder on price. And I'm seeing builders who will not lower their price because they have other people in the development who bought at a certain price. So they have to keep it at that price. 
Yeah. The truth is, if you go and find another home that is two, three years old, or even five years old, you're working directly with a seller who has a situation, who needs to sell, you're more likely to get a deal. And I like what you said about prices going down. If you buy a property today for 800 and you know we can't predict the future, but we can see where the trend is going and it keeps going down a little bit, by 2024, if it doesn't appraise for that amount, you have to pay the difference. Yes. Okay? So I think that maybe we should focus less on rates. Rates are important, but I'm thinking maybe from what you're saying, maybe people are better off buying that property today if they can afford it. And if rates go down in 2024, maybe you can refinance and pay a lower rate then. Yes, absolutely. So, I mean, what you're also saying too is it's sometimes on your first, uh, first time around buying a yeah. home, it's better to get into a resale yeah. Um, because then you have your property, you're paying down the mortgage, you're building equity. And then, you know, if you're in that home, when the market takes its next uptick, again, we don't yeah. know exactly when it's going to be, but real estate's a long time game. And then you, then you have that opportunity to refinance it or sell it and move into maybe that, you know, that maybe new, nicer new development, if you would. Yeah, absolutely. Now we're on to question number five. What are all the benefits of being a first-time home buyer? I think maybe they're speaking from government, like you know, regulations and all that. Yeah, so there are a few first-time buyer benefits, um, mostly regarding you know down payment and the costs associated with it. Um, the big thing, the two big things, is really the four thousand uh, dollar rebate the government gives you on land transfer taxes. Um, it does cap out there. Um, you know, I think we're, there's there's some rumors that maybe that will be increased, but four thousand dollars in savings is four thousand dollars in savings, and it can be very very helpful to a first time home buyer that's trying to get into the market. Uh, the second benefit is your ability to you know use your RRSPs. Um, for those of you on this webinar um, who have been you know maybe slowly putting money away year over year in your RRSPs for retirement. Um, you know that you can't touch that money without triggering a taxable event, okay? Which is really why you want to keep that money in there. You want to keep it in the market. Um, as a first-time home buyer, you actually, it's the one reason why you can take that money out and put it towards your down payment, right? Without triggering a taxable event. And the benefit as well is that as you contribute to your RRSP, you know, if you understand how they work, they actually lower your taxable income through your contributions. So then you can pull it back out. So you save there, right? And then you also save when you put it into the house. So yeah. those are your two main benefits, I would say. And again, yeah. you know, if you're putting uh, money into your RRSP, we've run into this circumstance a few times where somebody goes, I have $50,000 in down payment and I'm putting it all into my RRSP and then I'm going to take it right back out because they want to lower their taxable income for the year. Yeah. Uh, just, just keep in mind that the money needs to sit there for three months. Yeah. Just that's only, yeah. I'll just put that out there. Yeah. Yeah. No, I love that. And I have a follow up question on that. Sure. If I'm buying a property with my brother, who is a homeowner already, yep. will we be considered a first time home buyer? Um, so you're still considered a first time home buyer. Your brother will not be. Um, he'll, you know, he would have to be on the mortgage application with you. The only real main difference is that the land transfer tax benefit of $4,000 would be cut in half. So the max uh, rebate you could get from the government would be $2,000. Um, but again, at the end of the day, if their income helps you get into the home that you want, um, it's definitely an option uh, worth pursuing. Like I said, most first-time buyers have a you yeah. know, family contributor on their application. Yeah, I like that. I like that. And while you were speaking, I actually thought about something. I don't know if this matters. Can you say that such that you own 99% of the property, they own 1% and therefore you're able to get more of the rebate? Is that a thing? Uh, it is and it isn't. So, I mean, if you're buying, if somebody's coming on the mortgage application with you just to help you qualify, mm -hmm. um, it's, it's a great point that you bring this up. You can actually make sure the title of the property to the ownership structure of the property is structured so that the one person gets 99%. And maybe the person who helped you out only gets 1%. Yeah. Okay? That being said, it still doesn't change the rebate. If anybody on title has bought a house before, it is kind of yeah. cut down. Um, but it's also still a good point to bring up that you, people might not have known you can do that. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So question number seven, I think, is something that maybe somebody has to follow up with you. Uh, They're saying they have a household income of 140000 How much yep. mortgage can they afford with a 5% down payment? I think that will depend on a lot of the factors. <laughs> yeah, if, if it matters on a few things. Again, if we go, if you go back to that, bar, that one slide, mm -hmm. I don't know if it can be pulled up anymore. 
Um, but you can kind of, and that can help you uh, see where you're going to lie. So you say $140,000 of minimum down payment, just using the information that I posted on those slides mm -hmm. there. Okay. Yeah. I would say you're probably going to be in that at a 600 to $700,000 range. Mm -hmm. um, it, it might be more again, um, but just on a high level, I think that's where you would lie. Uh, again, yeah. if you want to know that exact number, uh, please do reach out and I can help you find that exact number. That won't be a problem. Absolutely. The next question is was submitted here on this webinar. So someone was asking about a recording. Yes, we are recording the webinar and a recording will be available. Actually, we post all of our recordings for previous webinars on our YouTube channel. And here in the chat box, you have, I think there's a link there that you can click to go to our YouTube channel. This recording will be posted there and all the other recordings from my previous webinars will be there as well. So to answer the question, yes, the recording is available and we'll share with you. And more importantly, you can find on the YouTube channel. On that same question, it continues to say, can you provide information for new immigrants? And also it continues to say how, I think it's a, it, they mean to say, how long do you have to be in Canada before you're exempted under the new immigrant rules for mortgages? Uh, so the, that's a, 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 a quite a long topic. Um, just on a high level, though, I mean, you don't have to be a citizen to get a bank mortgage in Canada. Um, you can have your PR status. So the second you do have your PR status, there's not going to be any issues. Um, there are some things for, you know, refugees or asylum seekers and everything. Um, again, I don't think we should go down that road right now. Um, I don't know if I'm answering the question specifically, but if you do have your PR, it doesn't matter how long you have it or when you bought it you can get a mortgage at the bank and qualify for everything that we were recently discussing. Mm -hmm. Okay. So I guess I, your answer to this is somebody should get in touch with you so you can look at your situation. That's what I'm thinking. Yes, of course. Of yeah. course. Yes. Yeah. Cause yeah, I guess yeah, that also to... depend on how long they've been employed for and all that you think. Yep. Okay. Um, yes and no. I mean, I wouldn't say that has much to do with it. Like if you have, if you're a permanent resident here in Canada, and you've only been at your job for three months, it doesn't exempt you from, because you're, because you're only PR, therefore you need more work history. Yeah. It doesn't really work like that. Okay. Alrighty. Learning for me as well. Yeah. <laughs> so I have another question here. It says, hi, I want to ask if you have 130,000 annual income, how much mortgage can we get approximately 5% down payment? Similar to that. Similar, other one. <laughs> similar to four, reach out, let's crunch the numbers together. Okay. Um, let's have that conversation. I'll give you your exact number. I can do it in a day. Um, just make sure we reach out. Um, there's, again, there's a couple follow-up questions I want to make sure before I tell anybody exactly how much purchase price they can have. Because uh, I want to tell people why um, and, uh, and what their current situation is. So we provide a full breakdown. Um, mm -hmm. High level, again, you're in that probably six hundred to seven hundred fifty, eight hundred thousand dollar range. Okay. Yeah. That's good. Another question is, can we close on a house if on probation? So I'm assuming that this is employment probation. Yeah, most likely employment probation. It depends. Um, down payment actually does make a difference here. Um, you know, if you're putting uh, a more substantial down payment on, it's not as big of a deal. That being said, uh, the short answer is no. But let's say, you know, you're, you're in the process of closing a home, but your probation ends before, like a week or two before your probationary period. That's still fine. Mm -hmm. again yeah. um, but I, you know if you're on a probationary period at work they're often only you know three months i would say 90 days is the off the, the normal yeah. probationary period mm -hmm. just wait till it's over don't yeah. take the risk right you know you never know what's going to happen at a job and if anything happens at that employer it's the people on probation that get affected first yeah so just uh you know make sure that you're you're not going to leave yourself in a position where you signed a real estate contract to buy a house and now you can't yeah. you've lost your job so just make yeah. sure you're taking that precaution yeah and i will just add to that that sometimes you can also speak to your employer i know you know a situation where our client um they were on probation we didn't know they were on probation so they bought a property and they, the lender say, you know, you're on probation. We have to wait until you are off probation, but they spoke to the employer and the employer was able to waive it. So I think, yep. yeah, maybe you speak to your employer before you purchase the home so that you're, yep. not, you're not in any awkward situation. But and the, the big thing too, is like, you know, if you're on probation with your employer currently, it doesn't mean you can't get pre-approved for a mortgage figure out what your max purchase price is, figure out what you qualify for, and even look at some homes, start, yeah. start, start seeing what's out there in the market. That way, when that probationary period ends, you're ready to rock and roll. 
Yeah. So just something to keep in mind. Yeah. Look, this question actually brings me to think about something else that I'd like to, I don't know if, if um, maybe it doesn't appeal to anybody who's on this, but how about people with criminal record? How does that work? Like, pro like maybe they're not on probation. They're, you know, they're out. I've had a client like that. What happens? It, it depends. Um, you know, there is different kinds of crimes. Um, so one that happens frequently that we see would be like a uh, DUI. That's that. That's one thing. Um, I think one thing they they don't really want to see um, if it does come up, if the bank does find it out, is any association with violent crime or any recent time served maybe in a penitentiary. So again, I'm not sure if I'm answering the question uh, high level. That's yeah. it, it can affect you, um, but some circumstances more than others. Okay, so it depends on the situation. It does. Yes. Okay. Moving on to the next question. Um, what is the best interest rate I can get today? Is it variable or fixed? No, is variable or fixed good? Um, so currently variable rates are cheaper than fixed rates. Um, uh, you know, variable rates were around 4.2 to 4.3%. Fixed rates were closer to that 5.2 to 5.5. So there is still about a 1% gap, you know, give or take between variable versus fixed. Um, I think one thing, though, you always have to keep in mind, and again, you know, we can have this conversation regarding, you know, your very people's various risk tolerances, mm -hmm. is that despite variable being lower, you know, always could keep in mind that interest rates are rising, it could increase, but you do have that buffer. So, uh, but if you to answer the question clearly, uh, variable rate rates are still cheaper. So they do come with a little bit more risk. And, you know, if you're able to tolerate it and you know you can afford your mortgage and you, it's okay if your rate goes up a bit, by all means, go for it. Um, full disclosure, I've been, I've got variable rate mortgages on all of my properties. It's the route I prefer to go with, okay? Yeah. Um, and historically, if you were to look at a graph, if I had it, you could put, look at the trend line between over a 30-year period, who's saved more money on their mortgage. It has been variable rate, uh, but I think the big thing to also never, you know, push to the side is just personal comfort. You know, yeah. what, you know it was you know, need to be able to sleep well at night, and sometimes people just want to know their interest rates fixed, their payments not changing. Um, you know, they get they get a lot of comfort out of that. So yeah. again, I hope it answers the question. Both are valid. Both have again their own positives, and negatives, like anything else. And again, a situation or a question, I'd be happy to work through with anybody. Absolutely. Absolutely. The next question is, is it a good time to buy a condo? I see condo prices are going up in GTA by 10% or more. And some of them have very high maintenance costs. What's your advice on, I guess I can take this question too, but you start. Sure. Um, well, I mean, you know, from a mortgage financing perspective, condo fees will, will actually make you qualify for less. So like, for example, um, uh, two condos at the exact same purchase price, well, let's say one of them has a much higher condo condominium fee, that's actually going to affect how much mortgage you can qualify on it, okay? Because all costs are considered on the new home. The principal, you know, the property taxes, the mortgage payment, and those condo fees. Uh, Joseph, I know you, you probably are a better person to take this. Normally, high condo fees are associated with an older building, okay? Yeah. Um, they really only ever go up. So condos That's can good. be a lot of great options, but if you're hoping that they're going to go down, it's never going to happen. So just make sure that you've considered that and factor that into your planning. Um, condos are always going to be a great place for first-time buyers to start even with condo fees, because they, again, just lower purchase price, yeah. um, you know, lower, uh, easier point of entry into the market is through condos. So again, yeah. um, I don't want to put them down because they 100% have their benefits. The condo fees are a conversation that should be probably having directly with your real estate agent. And, you know, when working with a realtor, they should be always like, like, like Jocelyn here, will always be able to give you various options with various kind of condo fees and mm -hmm. have conversations about the building, about the amenities, about what's available, where's it going. Um, so again, it depends, <laughs> like everything <Yeah>. else. <laughs> no, I feel the same way too. Um, my answer to this question would be, if you can afford a home that is freehold or has lower condo fees, I'd say go with that. To be honest with you, I also look at as like really high condo fees as maybe a sign that, you know, management too, because we've had some buildings, even here in Guelph, we have some newer buildings with crazy 
um, management fees. And in some cases, mm-hmm. it's because of management. Maybe they have, you know, they're yep. behind, they have to catch up. Um, and sometimes too amenities. Maybe they have a lot more amenities. They have a lot more fancy things to pay for. Yep. But to be honest with you, uh, if I can afford a freehold home or a condo with low fees, like in the 200, 300, maybe even up to 400 is fairly um, cheap. I yeah. would probably opt for that because when it comes to resale, they're also easier to sell. The ones with yeah. really high condo fees are also hard to sell. So yeah. I would probably opt for the ones with the lower condo fees. Absolutely. And again, you know, these condo fees, the reason that they always go up higher is because real estate only ever gets older. And mm-hmm. various, you know, so every, if, you know, if something breaks in your, in your unit, you would pay to fix it. But when things break down in the building, like the elevator, as for example, it is these, 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 these uh, savings of uh, uh, that, that's made up of the condo fees that services these costs. Yeah. So again, normally the higher management fees or higher condo fees are just a reflection of an older property. Yeah. Yeah. No, I totally agree with that. Um, our next question is, I think the person who is asking questions, following up on one of the questions and say, I meant, are there any benefits to new immigrants? If yes, how old should that be? Like, how long should you be in Canada before you can access those benefits? Are there any benefits to new immigrants? Maybe I should ask that question. No, the benefits, if, like, if yeah. you're a new immigrant and you're a first time home buyer, the same benefits as listed to, you know, people who are not new immigrants, let's say citizens apply. So yeah. there aren't really any benefits just for our new immigrants. Okay, sounds good. So that's all the questions that I have here. Um, we still have seven minutes. If there's any more, please bring um, some media questions. Otherwise, we, we, we've we answered all the questions that we had. Um, if there's anything you'd like to add to everything we say, please do so. And um, we'll close the webinar. Perfect. I was wondering if there's anything you wanted to add. Sorry. Oh, you, or me? No, no. Yeah, you've I been know, speaking great. for a whole hour. Yeah, I know. It has yeah. blown by. It hasn't yeah. felt like it. No, in that case, look, I should thank you very much for taking the time to be here. Um, these questions you've answered are very helpful. And actually, um, there's a few slides that I saw that I'd like to actually reproduce and share them with some of our first-time home buyers because they have information that I think will be very uh, valuable. So I appreciate that. Thank you for taking the time. Absolutely. Um, I was- and Jocelyn, I just, I know we mentioned this before the webinar, but I, I am going to send you that first time buyer checklist that yes. we've been preparing. Yes. Um, so this is something we've been working on. Um, it's just a very clear checklist in order of what the entire buying process is going to be. Absolutely. So, you know, if, if you follow it line by line, there'll be no surprises while buying. So uh, again, please reach out to Jocelyn. Uh, she'll have that tomorrow and she'll be able to give this to you. Uh, and it'll provide really, really helpful information to just really understand how the process works. And maybe, maybe even as a, a tool you can use, you can check it yeah. off as you go. Yeah, I love that. That is actually a bonus for those who are here on this webinar today. Um, thank you again for everybody who is here. I hope that your questions have been answered. More importantly, I hope that you learned something that will get you started on that journey to buy your first home. If you have any questions, we're here for you. Uh, that's what we do. So please reach out and we'll be happy to help you. Thanks again to our tech team and everybody who made this possible. We appreciate you a lot. So thanks everyone. Have a good evening. Thank you, Jocelyn. Thank you everyone who attended. Really Take appreciate care. it.